But it can be fun. So the theory was you scattered some decoys out and the other ducks would want to come down there because they saw them? They would think of maybe food or safety. And they would come down and to, to check them, check things out. Of course, you have to be well hidden because some ducks are very smart. Like the black duck, one of our more, more, more well-known ducks, uh, is very wary. And uh, to fool them, you have to be well, well camouflaged. Okay, well, my name is uh, Fred Reitmeyer. I have been carving for more than 60 years. My grandfather was a wooden boat builder and a duck hunter. And I learned to carve uh, decoys with his help. Uh, our local, our area for South Jersey here goes back to before the American Revolution. Uh, one of our ancestors, John Van Zandt, came from New Amsterdam, which became New York City, and uh, built, built privateers for the American Revolution as well as uh, being called Captain John because he, uh, he captained a privateer for the American Revolution. So we've had boat builders from before the American Revolution or maybe dating around 16, 1750 to uh, almost the current time. The last large boat building builder in the family was in uh, Atlantic City, the Van Zandt Boat Works. And they specialized in, of course, bigger boats, but also uh, lifeguard boats and Barnum Bay sneak boxes. Um, I have been carving again for, for more than 60 years with my grandfather's help, and I've taught three of my four children. Uh, two sons and a daughter enjoy carving. My youngest daughter is, is into more craft work, but she has two sons who, who I've taught to carve. So she says, even though I don't carve, I made two carvers. So we've been We've been in a carving business for since about 1750 to the present time, and uh, really enjoy ourselves with the carving. All right. Well, I grew up on the border of Absecon and Pleasantville, and uh, when I was about 12 or 13, I showed interest in carving decoys, and with my grandfather's help, I made my first rig of, of black duck decoys. Now. Uh, where I lived was about two blocks from the meadows. So my initial purpose for hunting decoys was for, for duck hunting. And as I got older and a little more experienced, uh, people wanted to buy some of my decoys. As I've gotten older, uh, become more and more of a, of a hobby or an artwork than, it, than I was initially. Okay, well I, I grew up near my grandfather's uh, house, which again was in a border of Epsic and Pleasantville. And uh, he would have been a duck hunter for many years uh, uh, before I came along. In fact, uh, at one point he was what they call a market hunter, where they just hunted, hunted ducks to feed uh, a market in, in Philadelphia or New York City. And uh, when that became obsolete, when there were too many ducks were killed, uh, market hunting kind of ended in the early 1900s. Uh, I uh, mainly hunted ducks for, for as a hobby and for food for the family, not so much uh, for, for uh, any other purpose. In the old days, it was more, very common for somebody in the family to pass down that, uh, that knowledge to the next generation. Uh, today, they, that's still done, but there's other sources. There's a number of books and magazines on decoy carving that allow you to get uh, uh, exposure to carving and, and, and the kinds of wood, kinds of decoy knives, kinds of paint, things that, uh, uh, again, these, some of these books are, are very good uh, in teaching, but, it, but just like uh, if you were a teacher in a classroom, you have a textbook, but it helps to have someone explain some of the parts of the, of the textbook. And that's how decoy carving is. 
you can start to carve, but then eventually uh, you get to the point where you really need further supervision to get really good. My favorite duck to carve is a, uh, a male mallard. Um, I think they're a very handsome bird. They're one of the more common ducks that people recognize a mallard. Um, the male especially with, with, with its, its, its nice collars. This, this, is, this is a uh, model Barna Cafe sneak box. The typical actual boat is 10 to 12 feet long. This is 12 inches, which is an inch to a foot scale. And uh, it's just, this, this uh, boat is all rigged up for, for duck hunting. It has the spray shield, 
and the prop. And we have some decoys in the back, some mallards, and a couple, couple of black ducks. Of course, we have oars. And uh, when you were out duck hunting, most of us uh, would, would have our back against this front cockpit wall and our feet underneath the back deck. And the decoys would be out in, in, nearby in the water. And when um, ducks come in and land, or get, get ready to land, then we would sit up and shoot. To, to, to prepare the boat, we would either use camouflage netting, in addition to the camouf, camouf, uh, the, the uh, olive, olive green, olive, olive drab paint, we would have, uh, th we call it thatch, but, but meadow grass to hide the boat, so that uh, it's really the best way to fool ducks, because it's, uh, it's, it's a one-man boat, which can't be a problem, but it's a one-man boat, and we camouflage it with, with grass and, and the camouflage netting, and the reason why I say it's a, it's a problem is that if you, have, if you have an issue, a health issue, or you fall in ice water, you're out there by yourself. So you have to be careful to uh, to, to, to uh, uh, be safe. Now today we have cell phones and we have ways to, to communicate. But in the old days, if you fell in, well, you're, you're falling in ice water. And uh, I've done that more than once. So you have to be very careful. Duck hunting in New Jersey goes back to the early 1800s, where before um, the first the first born again stink box was um, made around 1836. So we know that duck hunting goes back before that. And uh, this is an example of a born again bag decoy. My understanding is it was made by a man named Joe King, who died in the early 1900s, which means this this duck that I'm holding, which is carved by by Joe King, uh, is more than 100 years old. But it demonstrates again our method of carving where the ducks are made hollow so that they're lighter, more buoyant, more visible in the water than a heavy solid decoy. Now, some areas like Chesapeake Bay typically make their, their decoys solid. And it's, we, they seem very heavy to us. We, on the other hand, make ours hollow on purpose so that, that uh, they're lighter and more, more buoyant. Now, here in Chesapeake Bay, you might say that uh, because they're, they're solid, there's less chance for the wood to crack or split. Whereas with our ducks being hollow, they could be uh, more vulnerable to splitting. But actually, it's just the reverse. Because you have two different pieces of wood, the chances of the wood splitting is, is very remote compared to the Chesapeake Bay birds, which are solid and more apt to split. Um, and again, you know, ducks are made hollow. As I mentioned before, we call the, the raised neck a pedestal neck, and the tail, which is kind of rounded, we call that a paddle tail. Now you can see also that this decoy I found out in the meadows, and it's more than 100 years old now, but you can see where it was nailed together, the two halves, and the nails rusted off. They were iron, iron nails, the, iron, the, uh, the um, iron rusted off. Presently, I would say that most decoys that are made uh, are made for uh, the, the shelf or somebody's collection. Um, there are certain species of ducks which are not made uh, uh, in, in plastic or some other material. And this, this is a hooded merganser decoy. Uh, and, uh, and this is a, a male hooded merganser. They migrate here during the winter. And we hunt them some, but you can't buy hooded merganser decoys made of plastic or some other material. So if you wanted to hunt uh, hooded mergansers, you would have to uh, have somebody make you a, a pair or two. And we don't we we would never carve a rig that is like uh, 15 or 20 or 30 hooded mergansers. Usually only a pair or maybe maybe two pair. Uh, but again, this is one that's only made by hand, and we can, you can't buy them in the store out of plastic. Now this is a decoy that I made when I was 12 years old. One of my first decoys. And this is a decoy anchor. So just like you anchor a boat when you're fishing, you anchor our decoys or they would float away. Now this is a decoy anchor made by my, my uh, grandfather. Again it shows the Bay of Parking Bay tradition. You call this a ring type anchor. And uh, when we're, when we're going to be duck hunting, this, the anchor part would, 
would uh, fall into the bottom of the creek of the bay, and the duck would float up on top of the water, and the wind and the tide, the decoy would move around, giving the appearance of, a, of a, a, a activity. And then when the ducks come closer, when we hunt them. Now, I remember my grandfather making these anchors. He had a box of beach sand in his basement, about an inch thick, and he would wet that, and then press a wooden mold of this, this shape into the, the beach sand. And then he would have melted lead in a, in a pot and a ladle, and he would ladle the, the, the lead into the, uh, the sand mold. And the, the, one, the one side of the, of the anchor is, is rough from the sand side. The other side is, is smooth, the top side. But this was a very common way that they, the old timers, without having a store, would make their own, their own decoy uh, anchors. Good morning, my name is uh, Fred Wright-Meyer. I'm here to talk about ducks and decoy carving, duck hunting. How you guys doing? I'm Tanner Holcomb, grandson of Fred Wright-Meyer. And this is my Barnegat Bay sneak box. <laughs> Tanner's putting out the, uh, some, some, uh, some decoys, mostly black ducks and bufflehead. They were two of the most common ducks in the bay. And uh, uh, the one duck my, my grandfather made, so there's three generations of decoys that he's putting out. Some of the ducks here are carved by my, my son, Bob. Hello there. Part by my heritage. I learned decoy carving from my grandfather, it was Carl Adams, who's a well-known boat builder. Most of his boats were 20 to 40 feet, but uh, sometimes when his it, it, it boat works with too, too uh, cold in the winter, he would build seat boxes in the basement. I own two of his seat boxes. Uh, again, through my grandfather's heritage, um, I learned to carve. The first step in making a decoy is to Use the bandsaw, uh, preferably, and cut out the shape of the body. The head, the head is always separate. So, look at the top view. You can see how shaped the tail back here, and the head will be up here. The next step then, after it's carved, is to finish the bird ready for painting. Now, this is a bower decoy. See, there's a, there's a white kind of white stuff here. at the a fiberglass putty I use to hide the seam, and I also put the lead inside so I can glue the collar. Um, and this is this is the, 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 the middle step where it's carved, ready to be painted. And this is this is the finished product. So male or or uh, a, a great power. So what he would typically do is lay prone in the sneak box as he's trying to get in there with his head up against, um, say, the bow of the boat so that his head would not be seen by ducks flying over him and allow himself in a shooting position to face the decoys. He's, he's got a backrest and a cushion and it can be fairly comfortable when you're when you got out duck hunting early in the morning and it's, it's kind of quiet, it's easy to fall asleep. <laughs> the whole point of a sneak box is so that the ducks are getting as close as they possibly can before you shoot them. Now, when you're hunting out of, say, a boat of a different type, you're more or less shooting them as we call pass-by shooting. They're not necessarily going to land. With the sneak box are looking to land. So as soon as you see their wings lock up and their feet go down as if they're going to touch the water to land, that's when we, what we do now is we yell like, take them. My grandfather, as a boy, during the winter when when uh, he was too cold to work in the boat works, he was, he was a market hunter and uh, they would put him in barrels and sell them to restaurants. Now that was the market. And at one time, again, during the, during the market hunting, um, 
the family had a shack out in the meadows between between Brigantine and Great Bay, an area called Main Marsh. And uh, they would go out there, and sometimes it was colder then, they would get, get iced in. They'd have to stay there for maybe a week or two until the ice broke and they could get out. And another uh, story that uh, he used to talk about was uh, live decoys. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Parker building, there's a picture of a man holding a goose in his, in his, in his lap. And they used to train geese, Canada geese, and mallards to call in the wild ducks. And uh, it was worked so well that in the late 1930s, the government outlawed the use of live decoys. You notice that our decoys are all, all quite smooth without any feather or wing carving because that's because when you're out in the bay uh, you get a lot of mud on your hands and then the, the mud gets on the ducks, the decoys, and uh, detracts from the, the appearance. Uh, and that's one trouble with plastic decoys with, like, with, with wings and feathers and all. You have to clean them off periodically so they, they look like natural. But, uh, yeah, most people uh, find it cheaper to buy plastic. I bought my, my dust ball. A lot of times when we're not dust hunting, we use dust ball to attract the dust to us. You just can't imagine uh, all our decoys are in the water, they look real nice, but the ducks are all flying around, but they don't come down to us. So, in order to make it seem more logical, we use a dust ball. This is one that's the most easiest to use. If I were recommending spending a duck call for a young duck hunter, it would be something like this where you just pull back and then I quack. Again, it's the idea that the ducks think there's food down there or safety and they come down to, to see what's happening. Now, another kind of a duck call would be the kind you blow into. So your daily limit is six birds uh, and within that limit there's sub limits for each species. On a good day you get your limit, on a bad day you either don't get anything or you might get one black duck or two black ducks. A good day you'll, you know, you'll get the pintail which that's like the holy grail of the puddle ducks or you might get a couple mallards, a couple black ducks, pintail, maybe some shovelers. You know, you get that. That would be a good day. But on a bad day, you're just out there enjoying enjoying the views. I uh, retired from the South Jersey Gas Company in the year 2000, and uh, at that point, the, we the seaport was just opening up, and uh, they needed some decoy carvers. I was one that, made, that applied to become a decoy carver for the seaport and uh, at first I actually would carve one day a week, then it was two days a week and uh, it's something I really enjoy. So for around 20 years I've been a demonstrator at the seaport uh, teaching people to carve and paint decoys.